everybody. Uh, this is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello everyone, this is Steve Marinucci with another Beatles News Briefs. And today we have a special interview with author Dave Morell, who, if you have seen his books, knows that he worked uh, in the record business uh, for several record companies. Well, Dave also, before he became a record promotion man, met up with John Lennon and got a signed copy of The Butcher Cover, that John gave him. What prompted this interview was the news that the signed Beetle Butcher cover he had was being auctioned. Well, the word had is the operative word here because he no longer has it and he has not had it for some time and he says that early on. But I wanted to get that out of the way because I thought he had it when I saw the news and so did a lot of other people. And so I just wanted to make that clear from the outset that he does not. And he, like I said, he says that in the interview. Uh, in this um, interview, he talks about exactly how he got the butcher cover. And he t talks about details that aren't in the book. Uh, and we also discuss near the end of the interview uh, his opinions on Paul and Ringo in today's record market and radio market and how he would promote them which is kind of interesting anyway so here we go we hope you enjoy it well let's talk about the, the auction i i was surprised to see that you're you're selling this or that you're selling the butcher cover signed by john it's actually not me selling it oh okay yeah yeah i uh, let it go uh quite some time ago it it sold uh in auction there was a fellow who's a collector in california that ended up with it mm -hmm. um he put it on display with his collection he was looking to sell his whole collection for a whole lot of money which you know i didn't think anybody would ever come up with so i was surprised that he did uh, sell uh the beetle butcher cover signed by john that was in my possession for over 30 years um, it did sell, uh, I think, you know, with taxes and everything, $125,000. The mm -hmm. going rate was $100,000. Uh, it seemed to me that there wasn't a big uh, belly up to the bar to buy this thing. Uh, you know, the one offer and it was accepted and, and, he, and he walked. So um, he, he, the person, he or she probably feels, you know, that went so quick and I've got it. Uh, let me try to turn it over uh, for, for more money as an investment. Yeah. So, uh, that's probably uh, where it's gone to. So I don't right now the person who's putting it in this auction uh, that's been announced. I don't know who that is that has the record. I don't know. Okay. Okay. All right. But let's talk about the story about you getting it in the first place. I mean that it's recounted. It's recounted in your first book. Correct. Correct. It, it is recounted in my first book, but I really took the liberty to take a lot of it out. Uh, of of there for instance uh mm -hmm. as 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 we get rolling uh i'll explain more of this but john had done a big drawing on the back of it and um i didn't put that in the book because, oh really um i felt that if my book was such a blockbuster i'd have money and i'd be able to get it back <laughs> because nobody would really know the story behind that so you so you 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 made the book after you sold the, the album, is that correct? After left, yeah, after it left my possession, I, I, I wrote the book and I left a lot of details out because I didn't want whoever got the cover to sort of have such a certificate uh, okay. that, they, that they wouldn't need my uh, assistance in the mm -hmm. future. It would just be like, we don't need Dave. He wrote about it. Here's the record. We're done with him. Mm -hmm. I felt that uh, somebody with that kind of money, and I met a lot of uh, famous people uh, that had money and wanted it. Um, you know, I felt that uh, once they bought it, it'd be good because I want to see where it ends up to say, let me call Dave and, you know, let's have lunch. And what is the whole history behind this record? Mm -hmm. uh, part three of this story, and I, and I, and I mean to sound vague, is that uh, I didn't want to give it all away uh, because uh, my new book that's coming out <laughs> uh, takes place with my 10 years of Capitol Records. Mm -hmm. And it is in those 10 years uh, that Paul and I meet, uh, that Paul signs it, and then I meet George. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't. Uh, I, I wanted people to still want to read my works and not have rehashed stories in my books. Right. So right. 
But to take this back and to be very exciting, let me just share. Let me just tell a story and then we can open her up to questions. Mm -hmm. So um, all of us growing up, you know, we're, were fatuated with Rolling Stone magazine. That was such a very big deal for all of us to get a copy, to read it inside out. Oh, yeah. Um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So. In 1971, in between September, October, November, December, mm -hmm. um, there was an ad in the back of the magazine, and it was from Godzilla Records in Glendale, California, and uh, they were offering bootleg albums. And the three very famous bootleg albums that anybody that's explored this world that we both love so much would know that it would be Bob Dylan's Great White Wonder, right. which were these basement tapes mm -hmm. done in Woodstock. Uh, the, the Rolling Stones, there was an album called Liver Than You'll Ever Be, which mm -hmm, was put mm -hmm. out before the Get Your Yaya's album out. Right. And that was really popular. And the third one, and depending on where you bought it, was called Get Back to Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and that included um, the, the Beatles' uh, Let It Be album before it came out. So, right. And that was a significant record, you know, to have that. Mm -hmm. So in this Rolling Stone ad, it said... Uh, this Beatles record called Yellow Matter Custard. Right. So immediately you hear Yellow Matter Custard. You think I am the walrus. The guy mm -hmm. just doesn't know the name of the song. And it must be a unique take of that song. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also a listing of the songs on the record. Uh, one of them was um, um, a Dave Clark Five uh, t title. I can't think of it right Glad off. all over. Glad all over. Right. And I thought, oh, my God, the Beatles are doing like, this is incredible. <laughs> the, and to be quite honest, uh, you know, I didn't know a lot of those rockabilly songs that that they mentioned uh, on this list. I wasn't familiar with these titles at all. And we see these songs that we're not familiar with, even though we love music. So I want mm -hmm. to put it out there. It's just like these are so foreign to me. And yet when we think about this, I remember picking up a copy of uh, the Get Back album. A different bootleg, not the not the uh, get back to Toronto, and all of a sudden it would say uh, Beatle recordings, and it would say sweet and lovely girl, and I'd say what what is that? Mm -hmm. uh, it was for you, Blue. You know, mm -hmm. so they were twisting those titles around too much for me. Right. And um, but as uh, so um, as we both know, when we bought the record, we didn't know what we were in store for, and in mm -hmm. my case, I I sent for it, I waited it out, you know, it came. Uh, and the copy I had was, I think, red vinyl, and uh, the song titles weren't on the, uh, the the disc, you know. So I just put it on the record player. And uh, when the needle dropped, um, it was John uh, singing, and I instantly uh, said, "My God, that is the Beatles! There's no question uh, about this at all. This is the Beatles!" Mm -hmm. uh, and it was so joyful. Um, I have I have the I have I just pulled the copy of the Hot Wax book. Remember Hot Wax the book? Yes. And I ha I pulled the copy out just to to get the the titles of the songs, and I'll just read a few of them. Please. Besides, glad all over. I got a woman. Just don't understand. Please don't ever change. Shot of rhythm and blues. Sure to fall. Nothing shaken but the leaves on the trees. Lonesome tears in my eyes. Um. Everybody wants someone. I'm going to sit right down and cry over you. Cry and wait and hoping to know her is to love her bound by love. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's that's what we were looking at, you know, and, and some of those titles are right, but not all of them are, you know. Um, and and I remember, you know, we all had the same feeling that this was crazy. You know, this is, you know, what, where did these things come from? We, you know, you never knew. And uh, or, or even what years, you know, uh, right. actually. Mm -hmm. And when you think about a song like I Just Don't Understand, uh, when you finally uh, have the realization of what it is in life and you find out it's an Anne Margaret song. Right. You know, with, with a fuzz guitar that, you know, was five years previous to ever hearing a fuzz guitar. You go, mm -hmm. what? When you think about history, how Paul, uh, you know, if John didn't recall a lot of this, imagine Paul. When he recorded the first Mary Hopkins album, mm -hmm. did, uh, the honeymoon song "Bound by Bound by Love." Right. Uh, so that was unique. You wonder if anybody asked Paul when he was working with Mary, did, did you remember the Beatles doing this, and did you change the arrangements or, or, or things of of that nature? Mm -hmm. On the song, I'm going to sit right down and cry over you. 
I hope we get a chance to play it because the very first thing you hear on that song is is Ringo exploding on the drum kit. And he, no other song starts like that in the whole Beatle catalog. Right. And I've always wanted to say to Ringo, how did you know when to like they go, go, you know, and that the guys could just hit it so quick. Mm-hmm. It's such a strange uh, Beatle I- I- intro. So all those songs uh, brought so much to us. You know, again, we're hearing, you know, the Beatles have broken up. We know their first album. We know their last album. And here's, you know, this 12 songs or whatever the number is that we right. just don't have any information on. So um, I exploded out of my chair and I thought, what the heck, how am I going to find out uh, what this is? So I was fortunate uh, uh, because I was living in New York and uh, John Lennon was in New York and John and Yoko were hanging around the village uh, since June. They were living there. They were hanging mm-hmm. out with Howard Smith, who, who was a intellectual man who uh, had his own radio show. Right. Also was affiliated with the very hip newspaper, the the Village Voice, which represented Mm -hmm. the Greenwich Village in New York City. And in that newspaper, he was in charge of the column called Scenes. So this man knew the scene of New York's Greenwich Village better than anyone. And he knew Yoko and her artwork um, from being there. So uh, it was there, that connection through Yoko, that he he met John and began to take uh, John around the village. They met uh, David Peel. They went record shopping into record shops. Uh, he bought sneakers, you know, that 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 sort of strip in Greenwich Village called 8th Street, which right. then rolls over into St. Mark's Place, was something all of us did on a Saturday afternoon, make our way across the town to see the new posters, the day glow, the new sunglasses, whatever new buttons were <clears throat> to be worn albums to see um so this is this is where where john was at so he was also turning up with howard smith frequently on the radio Mm -hmm. and it was going so well for us fans to sort of catch wind or be a fly on the wall of what john was doing and exploring in new york because of this man howard smith telling us what john was doing seeing david peel in washington square park joining him busking around the town um, it, it was here that uh, when Frank Zappa was playing uh, at the Fillmore, a difficult interviewer, uh, Howard interviews Zappa and knows it's going to be kind of nutty. So he decides to pull one on Zappa and bring John Lennon. So when you hear the Howard Smith interview with Frank Zappa, you know, he, he opens the hotel room door and there's John Lennon. It's like, my God, come in. <laughs> and uh, of course, John ended up playing with him uh, that evening at the Fillmore East. Right. So I put my mind together and I said, I got to write a letter to Howard Smith, the DJ, and say, hey, you know, no big deal. I got this record. I don't know what it is, but it sure is the Beatles. Uh, if you have a moment and i know you're a very busy man it'd be really cool if you ask john lennon uh, about these songs Mm -hmm. um and if he's interested you know i'll I'll send it to you please guys play it on the radio that that, simple and um so i wrote a a little note and you know with a little tiny pencil bad handwriting to howard smith at the at the the village voice and believe it or not within a week i I came home and uh, my mother said uh howard smith called and to me, this was like a movie star calling me at home. Right. Like, wow. Let me call up. So uh, they said, Village Voice. I said, uh, Howard Smith, uh, who's calling? Dave Morell. Uh, what's it about? I, I sent him a letter and he and he called me to speak to him. So he picks up the phone. And the first thing out of his mouth was, I showed John your letter. Oh, and my God. He wants to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? So I, I went. And no. you, you weren't working for, were you working for Capital at this time or not? Uh, oh, no, no. I was, I graduated high school in June of 1971. Okay. And I didn't join the music business till June of 1972. So you were just a fan at that time. Just, I, I, I was a deadbeat. I wasn't oh even going God. to school. I was, wa- I was waking up at 1130, watching Hollywood Squares. Figuring out what to do the rest of the day to start the following day. I was a, uh, you know, I was not uh, in society yet. That's fun. Um, That's wonderful. So he said, "Could you come over at seven o'clock, uh, pick me up at the Village Voice, and we'll go up to meet John." 
So I said, yeah. And I put together uh, a, a, a suitcase I had, like a suitcase you'd bring if you were going with your mother on a bus to Cooperstown or something. And I filled it up with Beatles stuff that I thought him being a Beatle, him running around, wouldn't have had time to see a lot of stuff presented. And a lot of the stuff that was really nutty and, and unusual was the American stuff that we all that they put out. So I'll give you a couple of examples. And I, I, I filled up my suitcase and I, I brought it over to meet John Lennon. Now, as I pick up Howard Smith. He says to me, you're going to meet John. Uh, when fans meet John, they, they, they lose it. You know, it just doesn't go well. You know, they're, they're in his face. You know, it's, it's quickly he wants to be removed uh, from the scene. Uh, so he said, have you ever had anything with John Lennon before? I said, you know, it's funny. Uh, you had John on and Yoko on your radio show a few months ago where it was a complete freak out where John and Yoko came on, but the radio guy, Howard, didn't say tonight, ladies and gentlemen, my guests are John and Yoko. They'll be here in just a few minutes. We're going to talk for an hour. And uh, after now, we'll take some phone calls. So uh, tell your friends and let's listen. They decided to do this avant-garde happening where as soon as the clock struck time for Howard's show to be on, they began to act weird, almost like the John and Yoko wedding album where they start whispering to each other, then they start screaming at each other, and then they bring it to a whisper. And it was this insanity going on the radio. And it was late at night, and I was listening to this. And I'm in my room, uh, and as they're whispering, I'm turning up the volume. And as Yoko screams, and my mother's banging, go to bed, school, you know, it's late, it's Sunday night, turn that stuff off. So it was like this back and forth with the volume control and my mother screaming at me. So after an hour, I guess the people listening said, what in the hell is going on in New York City on the radio with no commercials and this insanity? So after the first hour, the phones exploded, you know, lighting up like what is what is this? So John, in the most craziest fashion, uh, started to answer the phone. And the in, and the uh, back and forth with the phone callers is so wonderful. Um, I actually think this would be a great record album. And one day I, uh, I wish Yoko would put this out. But to give you an example of how nutty the calls were going, um, I wanted to get through and speak to John Lennon. So I kept dialing. 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 I kept getting a busy signal. I kept getting a busy signal. Meanwhile, my radio's on in the room. I'm listening. I put the tape recorder on so I could record it and I'm working it. I'm working it. And all of a sudden the phone rings. I got through. So the phone is ringing in my ear, in my room, in my house in Kearney, New Jersey. And in my ear, I hear John Lennon's voice. And I'm like, oh, my God. And the first thing he says is, could you say it a little lower? Now, before I spoke, I had to think about what I would say. And I wanted to say Dave Morrell so that my friends in my neighborhood, in my school would say, Dave, he's not he's not fooling. He did speak to him. He, here he is saying Dave Morrell. So that was important to me. Secondly, since he was going off for over an hour on the radio talking about everything that was fun, I figured I'd throw him a, a, a ringer with the Bob Dylan Great White Wonder to sort of open him up to either a crack about Dylan or crack about bootleg albums, or something to twist him. So, of course, when John Lennon's actually speaking to you, your mind gets uh, a little spurty. So when John answered the phone and said, could you say it a little lower? I said, Dave Morrell kissed the great white wonder. And John goes, could you say it a little lower? I said, Dave Morrell kissed the great white wonder. He said, could you say it a little lower? Dave Morrell, kiss the great. Meanwhile, my mother's banging on the door. What's going on in there? What is that noise? What's that sound? And John goes, could you do it? Could you say it a little lower? Dave Morrell, kiss. John says, we've almost got it. One more. A little lower. Dave. And it's just funny as hell. And after I get it out, he says, 
thank you. You've won Mayor Lindsay's legs and slams the phone down. So when I'm with Howard Smith and he says, did you ever communicate with him? I told him this story and Howard flipped. He goes, Dave, that was one of the best calls we got that night. When we went out to eat afterwards, we kept talking about that call. That was so funny. You really went with it. He says he's going to love you. So imagine how great you feel. So we went to the record plant uh, and we got out of the car and we're heading into the building. And uh, John, uh, at this time, this is the first time I ever met him. Uh, I had met him again and again, and it was at the record plant. But this very first time was uh, on the first floor. And he invites me. He, he was at the door to invite to bring me in. And I was stunned at, uh, at him. Because being a 10-year-old kid, first seeing the Beatles, I, I imagine these giant men like a Johnny Cash that I'd be looking up at. Mm-hmm. John wasn't like that. He was smaller than me. I had outgrown him, and it was kind of odd. But he was very soft, a very soft handshake, a very welcoming, a very, very heavy eye contact, and come on in. And uh, when we got into the actual recording studio, uh, he was behind the board. It was Howard Smith, me, uh, John, and one other man behind the board. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, I looked into the studio, and in front of me was about six or seven guys. It was David Peel in the Lower East Side. He was working Mm -hmm. on this album. Uh, And he said, you know, grab a seat, and uh, we'll we'll get to it. We'll get to this. Uh, And then I watched uh, David, uh, and we became good friends, David Peel and I. But uh, that music was hard to take. Uh, but I could see where John loved the busking of it, the uh, authenticity of what David was reaching for. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so I understood it, but it definitely was uh, uh, taking a lot of John's time. And he was really committed to this. You know, you've got John Lennon committed to you working with you, no matter how long it's going to take. It was it was very interesting to sit there and think that way. Mm-hmm. So uh, I call this like an act of God, because all of a sudden, Peel, uh, John said, let's move to the next song. And David Peel said to him, I, I, I left the words in the, uh, home. And he goes, what? He goes, yeah, yeah, but it'll just take a minute. I'm going to have somebody go get it. He goes, all right, let's take a break. So, you know, gave me or John this uh, space. Um, so David left the studio, went to get it. And now John, you know, got up, yawned, stretched and said, OK. What do you got? And um, I opened up. I said, oh, I brought a suitcase full of stuff I'd like to show you. He goes, yeah, put, put, put it here. Open it up. And so I started to show him some Beatle memorabilia I didn't think he would have seen. Mm-hmm. Well, one of them was, the, of course, the funny Beatle bubblegum cards. And uh, the first series of the Beatle bubblegum cards, some artist did a rendition of the Beatles with no hair. Right. I so, remember that. So I showed him the card with the hair. No big deal, right? He, he didn't care. And then without the hair. And he cracked up. He, he cracked up. And he said, this is so funny. He said, I look so Japanese. Go show this to Yoko. She's sitting right out there. She wasn't in the studio. So I, I left the room for a minute. I bring the Beatle card. She looks up at me, says, yes. I said, Yoko, John wants me to, would like me to show this to you. And she goes, give it to me. She takes a pen out and signs it. <laughs> Oh my God! Back to me, and sends me back in the room. You know, okay, she she just wasn't in on the gag. So then I showed him uh, on Savage Records, Best of the Beatles album. Mm-hmm. That record, yes. That picture of the Beatles uh, in Germany on those right. uh, uh, trucks, and uh, it said Best of the Beatles, and of course it had ten songs you and I never heard of, but Pete Best's head was circled. Right. And it was actually peak best of the Beatles. Right. When I explained that to John, he was livid. You know, he, he, he threw it across the room. He threw the whole record across the room and bent the cover. And to me, it was a rare record. Uh, he just said, yeah, I can't believe this. The one, though, that really got his attention was the Savage Young Beatles. Oh, yeah. Because he wasn't putting it together and didn't want to, that it was on Savage Records. Mm-hmm. So it would be like saying the Capitol Beatles. Or the VJ Beatles, or the Tolly Beatles. You know, this was the savage young Beatles, but he made it sound like somebody thought they were savages with leather and rock and roll and devil music. So he loved that record big time. 
And uh, I, I had a bunch of other things, the beetle talcum powder, uh, <laughs> you know. Oh, and then this is interesting. This is one of the most fascinating things that I was worried about. Being a beetle collector at the time uh, and having access to New York City and going to Greenwich Village on Saturdays, as we just discussed, mm -hmm. it was a newsstand on 6th Avenue and 8th Street. It was one of those international newsstands. Mm -hmm. And me and the boys would always go over there and we'd see Melody Maker. We'd see Sounds. Right. See Disc. New Musical Express. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it was driving us nuts because it was so well done, but it was too expensive. It wasn't 50 cents like uh, Rolling Stone Man or even whatever. It was an expensive newspaper and it was six weeks late. They were right. coming over by the boat then. Yep. So, um, you know, that was a big deal to, to get those those magazines um, at that time. Freeze framing us sitting there for a minute. Now, here's a part of the story that's so fascinating uh, that brings it all together. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there with John Lennon, and the day in history is December 7th, 1971. That's the day that I'm speaking about, that I'm with him with the Beatle memorabilia. Okay. All right. 30 days earlier, exactly, on November 7th, 1971, in Newark, New Jersey, the Newark Star Ledger, Sunday edition, did a uh, interview with John and Yoko, and it was a full picture of them on the top half page, and then the interview on the bottom. And the very first sentence said this, I went to interview John and Yoko who are currently staying on the 17th floor of the St. Regis Hotel in a suite. And in the suite is a vase with flowers, a couple of guitars, two books, posters on the wall, and a withdrawn copy of the Beatles as bloody butchers in, <laughs> his, in his room. So I thought... John Lennon is carrying around the Beatle Butcher cover. He's not got 10 copies of the Imagine album. You know, he doesn't have Sergeant Peppers. He has the Beatle Butcher cover with him in a, in a hotel room. Too crazy. So as this as I'm showing John this memorabilia now and also I want to express this to, to, to you and, and everybody. Many people like let's say Bruce Springsteen's going to sign his book today. You get online. Next, mm -hmm. next, don't talk, next, next, no pictures, next, next. With John Lennon, we weren't rushed. We weren't rushed. Time went by, like more than an hour with him to express yourself to him. Hmm. It was at this time, he said, this collection's great, the stories you've got great. Because I started to ask him about um, Beatles songs like, uh, and, and, and playing at Shea Stadium and did the Beatles rehearse and when did they bring a new song into the set and, put, and bring one out? You know, tell me about that. So we got into that conversation. And it was then that he said, hey, you know, what are you missing in your Beatle collection? And I said, you know, it's the Beatle Butcher cover. And the reason is because it's you can get one down in the village, but they're two hundred dollars. You know, I never spent spent ten dollars for a record type of thing. It was way beyond. I just have to wait it out, you know, till I get a job and I have money and I'll I'll one day get the Beetle Butcher cover. He says, I'll I'll get you mine. I went, huh? He goes, yeah, I've got one. And he made a phone call to his assistant. And right in front of us, you know, he didn't leave the room. There was a mm -hmm. phone right there on the board by this in the recording studio. And he called the guy to bring the butcher cover over. And um, so now I've got another 30 minutes with John. By the time the guy brings it over, it might have been even longer. And when it came, the first thing that happened wasn't like, here you go. It was like John Lennon with a fan, me, and with Howard Smith, who's different, He's older than John. He's been around. He's been in the art scene. He knows Yoko. And so Howard is the guy that said, what is this? What's, what, what are we talking about here, Dave, <laughs> John? And now Lennon, who's probably told the story so many times, really went deep with Howard Smith to tell him everything he could about the Beatle Butcher cover. Okay. <laughs> now, on the back of the cover where the back cover is, you know, that shows you the uh, albums for sale mm -hmm. advertisement on the back of any cover. 
he had taken the, the tip that was kind of coming off. The glue wasn't good. And it pulled it right off. And it left a scar in the middle, meaning that a little too much um, paper came off. And uh, it was there that as we were talking, he took a pen and began to draw. He began to draw. And it wasn't like um, you see when he signs the lithographs. John Lennon, John Lennon, John Lennon, John Lennon. And then 15 minutes later, they go, John, stop. It's just a straight line. This was him drawing like he would in his early books. Mm -hmm. But we hadn't seen drawings from him that took time since those books were put out. So he did this beautiful, beautiful piece. And, um, and then he turned it over and he put a cloud over his head with a pen and put to Dave from John Lennon, December 7th, 1971. And as we began to part ways, he said, I know how much this means to you. I really do. But I want to say something. Watch the, watch the backside of this. That's the rare one. <laughs> There's only one of them. And he was letting me know that, you know, if, let's say if you displayed it in the living room, you might want to flip it every six months, you know, mm -hmm. to have that original artwork. The drawing, yeah. Uh... So that's where that came in. Now, did did Smith record? Smith did not record him talking about this, right? No, but that Sunday evening, um, he did. Uh, he had me on, and it was extensive. And uh, there's a series of albums now called the Howard Smith Tapes. Mm -hmm. And on one of those, uh, cut two is called Beetle Maniac, and it's uh, it, me and him. Uh, on the radio. And, and of course, I sound like I have uh, gravel in my mouth. I was, you know, a kid uh, mm -hmm. speaking and I was out of breath as we re retold the story of what happened on the radio that mm -hmm. night. And uh, and so that was completely incredible. And John, uh, in an interview that Howard does, I have the tape. I could probably play it on the phone here. You know, um, he's interviewing John. Um, and he says, uh, you know, uh, Dave Morrell, the, the guy that got you know, the, that thing you wanted. Mm -hmm. goes, oh, yeah, yeah. Did he find the tapes? And he goes, well, I, I don't know. I'm going to have him on tonight. I'll ask him why. And John goes, oh, because I listened to it and uh, we're going to put it out. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, we're going to put it out. And he goes, mm -hmm. you mean like the very first Beatles album? He goes, yeah. He says, I was talking to George about it the other night and we think it'd be great. And. In a book called uh, uh, the Hunter Davies book of the John Lennon letters. Right. If you look in that book, there's a letter in December 71, which is what we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, where he writes to Paul and says, Paul, here's the bootleg of our audition. Not bad, huh? So, you know, John really got into that. Right. In a very, very big way. So, um and then he, he, you know, we, be, you know, he knew my name and knew who I was and our relationship uh, started there. Now, let me tell you something about this cover that's always driven me nuts. Go ahead. Is, is again, the actual center point on earth for me is that article from November 7, 71 of the writer speaking about describing John's room mm -hmm. at the St. Regis. OK. Do you know that last week in our lives? A&E Network ran a, a new movie called John and Yoko, Above Us Only Sky. Right. Okay. I watched it like all of us. And in the last 15 minutes of the film, um, the man narrating it, I guess, was one of the camera guys that John was working with. And he says uh, on television or, you know, on this uh, thing, he says, you know, so we finished filming and then John was going to New York uh, and we were going to, you know, work on it. And I said to John, hey, New York, let's shoot some some stuff in New York. It's New York. You kidding? Let's we, let's shoot some more material. Mm -hmm. So we began to shoot on the very first day at the St. Regis Hotel in his suite. <laughs> Last week, Steve, I jumped out of my chair. I went, are, are you kidding me? We're going to see footage of John Lennon in the room of the St. Regis Hotel. And boom. It came on in color. There's John on the couch playing the guitar. There's Yoko on the couch with him. And there in the film is the Beatle Butcher cover. Hmm. So it's just mind boggling. Hmm. Now, 
that is a great uh, sort of pause to bring that to a nice boil. Now, since then, I've run into guys that are the biggest collectors in the world. I won't call them out on this. Mm -hmm. They know who they are, and we all know who they are. The biggest guys that if you said, I want to, I am a millionaire and I want to buy the richest thing, these are the guys I'm talking about. Right. So these fellas seem to believe that uh, Capitol Records, Al Corey, who was the head of promotion, uh, made up these um, uh, butcher covers, slapped on a slick on a white cover and, and made one up for John. And that's all this is. That's all it was ever. Lithograph John wanted one. We we slapped it on. You know he got it. Mm-hmm. But that story is not right because many stories. I worked for Al Corey. Dave okay. Morrell worked for Al Corey. So don't you think I asked Al about this? Right. That didn't happen. Um, if that did happen, wouldn't Al Corey have had one? Wouldn't they have made up many more of them and given them to radio people? Right. Would John have given it out more uh, leisurely? So if anybody says that's the story, it's not the story. And if you and if they do call you, we'll have them. We'll have both of us on and debate <laughs> and prove to them that story is not right. Okay. Uh, but the fellow who began that story, who's a very famous guy that bootlegs the Beatles, made up a few, went with that story, and ripped a lot of guys off that are <laughs> stuck with them and want to believe that story. So when I get with them and I meet with them, we have the old arm wrestle and then they apologize because they know they've been ripped off. OK, so I wanted to get that out of the way. OK, so meanwhile, I'm, I got the cover. I've got uh, the autograph. I've got the drawing on the back and I'm, you know, I don't have a job. <laughs> so uh, oh, uh, so the next step in my life was. Me and my Beatle boys, me and my friends, when we take off school and we go to New York City, sometimes we wouldn't go to Greenwich Village. We'd go uptown and we'd drop in on all the TV shows like the David Frost show, the Merv Griffin show. We went to those shows religiously, uh, no matter who the guests were. Right. Because we, we love that stuff. And it was in that occasion that we found out where Apple Records were. And it was at 1700 Broadway on the 42nd floor. So we decided to go in the building, push the elevator, get off at 42 and see what it was like. And we'd say, hey, we're a couple of Beatle fans. You know, could we get some pictures or something? And the girl would uh, buzz somebody in the back and a, and a boy like us came out um, and handed us a manila envelope. And in each envelope was about two or three beautiful pictures of, uh, the, of the Beatles. And uh, his name was Ivan. And him and I connected. And his name is Ivan Kral, K-R-A-L. And we became best friends. And Ivan um, came from Czechoslovakia uh, in 68 when they pushed everybody out. And uh, we developed a relationship. And and just to tell you who Ivan is, he went on to become part of the Patti Smith group. He, Hmm. uh, He was an Iggy Pops group. His songs have been recorded by U2, David Bowie. So it was extraordinary to to for me to have my friend go so far. I was so excited for him. Oh my, that's that's a, that's wonderful. Are you are you sad that you that you sold the the butcher cover now? Uh, no, no, I'm not because you know everybody has things in life they have to deal with. You know, mm-hmm. a sickness, whatever it could be. Right. And I knew deep down in my soul after the, the person that held this close to his heart for over thirty years. Uh, that if I was with John and said, you know, we're talking about a piece of cardboard with a signature, um, you know, I it's time, you know, and right. so that, w- that wasn't an easy choice, but it was the right choice. OK. And I know he would uh, go for that. And uh, I had other things signed by John and other valuable things. So, oh, OK, uh, you know, uh, I've got some beautiful things. So that 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 had to go the way that went. Okay. Um, and, you know, um, since it was sold somebody's bootlegged it and they sell it online for about two hundred dollars and i ordered a copy and i have it and it looks perfect it (laughs) looks absolutely (laughs) perfect that if i handed it to you would say i can't believe i'm holding it so i don't feel as though i've lost anything they didn't give it they didn't give it to you they said 
No, no, they didn't. They, they, they didn't. And they didn't say, are you the guy who's, who this is? <laughs> you know, just a typical bootlegger, business to business. And wow. I thought that was kind of cle- clever. But it's nice now to be able to show people and not worry that it's an expensive thing. You wouldn't want bent. You could just say, let's have a coffee. Dig this. Yeah. And it looks yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, let's talk. But, let's talk about your book for a minute. Um, you, you've, you, the, uh, I, as I was telling you earlier, um, I have the first two copy of uh, copies of your books, your first two volumes. You actually have put out the third. Yeah. And and you said you're about to make it make that available on Kindle. Yeah. He, he, uh, the, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. In my first book, the first book of the memoirs ends uh, before I'm 21 years old. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's that. And there's a lot of Beatles stuff chasing John around New York, the Beatle Butcher cover story. Um, uh, we did a lot of things that year. I worked with Geraldo Rivera. We did a, a, a the, the Chuck Braverman film uh, that collected an award. So there was a lot, lot of Beatles stuff in that first book about a young boy who's a fan and getting his wheels going. That one's called that one's called for everybody out there. It's called Horse Doggin. Yes. Vol- called volume Horse Doggin. one. I came up with that name thinking for sure it would be in the encyclopedia within a year, but I don't think anybody cares or understands what the name means, but it's okay. 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 You know, you're allowed a false start. Right. The the second book, you know, I was fortunate. I, I went to work in a warehouse of a record Mm -hmm. company and over time I eventually became a promotion man for Warner brother records. And the year was so extraordinary that it had to just be a standalone book. I mean, in that book, I, um, 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 one day, uh, you know, Bob Merlis, who had an amazing career in the record business, um, said, hey, Dave, we're ha- he was in, he was in publicity. I was in promotion. He said, hey, Dave, uh, we're having lunch today with this uh, English artist who's like this old guy that wears spats. He, you know, he's like an Al Capone guy. I said, huh? He goes, yeah, his name is George Melly. And uh, we, we might do something with him. We're going to have uh, lunch with him next door. GM Belly's one of New York's finest restaurants in a private room. I said, OK. So I go in and who brings him to America? Derek Taylor. So I chewed off Derek's right ear. He's, you know, he has holes in it from me biting it. (laughs) And we became best friends. And uh, then uh, he brought me over to John Lennon's house. You know, we sat on the bed. Uh, We played John the Washington Coliseum movie that he hadn't seen. Uh, John turns the tables on us and and plays uh, How Do You Do It that he'd been carrying around with him forever. (laughs) So that that book is very, very exciting. And my third book um, was uh, called 45 RPM, which is called uh, 45 Recollections Per Minute. And it's about, you know, I mean, uh, Elvis, John Denver, um, Iggy Pop, Lou Reed, uh, everything I had done in the music business from 1974 to 1980. Mm-hmm. Uh, very proud of that work, but uh, uh, drum roll. Blah, 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 blah. I really uh, went from the day one when I thought, uh, could I put a, a pen to paper? I really believed I could. I could do a good job, my best ability on this book that's about to come out. It's by ten years. I got to spend an entire decade at Capitol Records, a place mm-hmm. I always dreamed of, going to the Capitol Tower in Los Angeles. One time I was in the, uh, with John in the studio at Record Plan, and as he was writing out the words to Just Because from the rock and roll album, it was just me, him, and Jimmy Iovine in the studio. And mm-hmm. John said, Jimmy, play him what we're working on. And to hear, uh, you know, uh, Be My Baby by John Lennon at volume 10 in a recording studio on a two-inch tape with John Lennon, it, you just can't you can't have a better day in your life no and at the t- when i worked at concord um the uh, john burke who did the the ray charles album was working with uh, george benson and mccartney came by he heard uh, george uh, recording and they were working on bring it on home to me and he said paul you want to sing it he goes nah nah no thanks but it sounds good and so the next day, uh, Paul came back. He walked by the studio. Goes, now I'm ready. I got the words. Let's go. <laughs> Into the studio, and he knocked it off with Benson and the baby out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, Great. so when is when is the the new book covers what? Well, I'm here's what I'm going to do is I finished writing it. We're in the editing stage and formatting it stage. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to release a couple of uh, early chapters. But what's going to what what I'd like to say to everybody is that. Um, uh, here I am working at Capital, a dream come true. But of course, there are no Beatles there. 
we are giving away the Beatles catalog. But a couple of quirky things happened. Uh, for mm-hmm. instance, when fewer Ferris Bueller's Day Off came, Twist and Shout was a hit, so we put right. that back out again. Right. But uh, the real key for me came when Paul re-signed with Capitol Records. This was going to be Dave Morrell in New York working with his idol, you know, and wanting to do the greatest job I ever did. You know, I worked my whole life to to work hard to get where I got. And now that Paul was going to be working with me, I sure as heck wanted to do the greatest this, job in the whole wide world. This was the first time, not this most recent time. That's right. This, this what year, what year are we talking? Us. What yeah. year are we talking? Oh, uh, I guess 86. Okay. In fact, that was his last top 10 tune until he had that one with Rihanna. And Kanye, so I was proud uh-huh. to be on his last top ten, and uh, and and we won't get into it now. But the book will explore, you know, meeting him, uh, and 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 having the opportunity to to get quiet with him, and then present him with the Beetle Butcher cover. When are, <laughs> when are we uh, when are when are we going to see that? I would say the book will be out in six months. My my game plan right now is to put my book three, 45 RPM, on Kindle within the next month and utilize that. You know, Dave's uh, last book is now on Kindle and his next book will be coming in the next few months and then or start releasing uh, advanced exclusive chapters as I did with you last time mm-hmm. and really get this thing launched. And then I'm going to follow that up with a book uh, that will all be about what we all can identify with growing up, uh, you know, and loving the Beatles and getting into a band and going to the concerts, you know, and and I've got that. And then I found all my archive photographs of when I was a fan and I went to uh, the Fillmore East and I went to see John's one to one benefit. I took like over 100 pictures, you know, that nobody's seen. So I'm going to put all my pictures as a fan and really bring them sharp into focus and really talk about what those times were like. So it's a busy full schedule. <laughs> and, um, I'm excited to share all of this. You, uh, you, you used to post some great pictures on Facebook. You, I haven't seen any recently, but I remember you used to post some incredible stuff on Facebook. I is, are, yes. Go ahead. I, yeah, is that what we're talking about? Well, uh, my favorite thing in the world since I was a five-year-old is show and tell. I mm-hmm. love to go to school and pull something out of the bag and, and do a show and tell. And I love when kids did a show and tell. So my Facebook posts were just me busting out, pa- busting out boxes that were full of files that had hundreds of things that uh, I thought people would enjoy very much. Mm-hmm. So uh, because it was taking up some some effort and energy and then replying, uh, it took my concentration off the book. So I'm on intermission with Facebook. But all that stuff's going to come out. There's no okay. sense putting, uh, holding on to that. No. And what I hope to do is, um, uh, besides buying my book on Amazon, I'm hoping to buy it from me, where I can include some of these um, uh, facsimiles of memos I received, of pictures you haven't seen before. Uh, just some very interesting artifacts that uh, I, I came across in my life that we all love, but most fans wouldn't have got the chance to get or see. So I'm excited mm-hmm. to be able to share those with everybody. Let me ask you a couple of questions um, uh, on as a record promoter, uh, sure. record promotion man. Listen, I'm going to talk about Paul first. The the uh, people were were really kind of surprised with the Kanye Rihanna Paul McCartney four or five seconds thing. How would you have promoted that had you been doing it? You know that's a tough record because it had multiple formats. Mm-hmm. So um, without using Paul's name, you could get some you know R and B play, some deep space play. It's almost like when I worked with Donny Osmond and Soldier of Love. They put that record out without saying it was Donny. Um, so you would have had that angle. Mm-hmm. Secondly. Um, just like any artist, a Rihanna would have an up-tempo dance tune, and that song was such a slow burn, you could really get that ad- adult contemporary spin on it. Mm-hmm. So you could get uh, multiple formats going on it. Um, in fact, the funny thing with Paul was the hardest format for him when I was working with was the pop format, because mm-hmm. those records just weren't exploding like the Beatle records. So mm-hmm. you had to come down a different avenue. And a lot of times, the record companies had put so much effort into top 40, so much effort into the FM rock stations that there was windows open in the adult contemporary world that you could squeeze things into. That's how Simply Red broke. That's how Crowded House broke. 
Mm-hmm. And so uh, that song that we're talking about, Rihanna could start to fit into that. Just like Madonna, who had done so many dance disco tunes, f- would do a ballad and it would fit into that genre. So uh, it'd be a multi-genre record and certainly based on your relationships because the biggest problem when a Beatle puts out a record is that a programmer says, why do I want to play an unfamiliar song by Paul Ringo uh, when I could be playing their biggest hit right here where nobody will tune out? So I'd rather play a big hit now that everybody will turn the volume up than to play something unfamiliar that they're going to turn my station off. And that is a very difficult uh, angle to take as a promotion man to get on board and talk them into uh, letting it breathe. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, in that case, the way Paul did the build up to Egypt Station obviously worked because it hit number one. Yes. Were you were you surprised at the the way they did that? Um, No, because uh, the whole sales thing goes back to me as a professional insider with the. Dream Girls. Mm-hmm. I, Dream Girls had only sold 20,000 units and it became a number one record and it stunned everybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jason Mraz, and, uh, and I'm not putting these guys down, but he had a number one record. And you think, how mm-hmm. the hell did he do that? You know, he couldn't get those numbers. But um, then I saw uh, like a, a James Taylor where you, if you really got the right team together, the giveaways, the retail, the placements, um, you, you could get into that illustrious numbers that you couldn't do before because the records would come on in the 80s, go to the 60s, the 50s. And now you have that first week where you've got to have that giant number because that's the highest peak you'll have. So if you're an artist that's not going to take advantage of, uh, you know, the Ellen DeGeneres, the Oprah, the late night TV, the Saturday Night Lives, it's v- extremely difficult to try to grab that over the second, third, fourth week and even to try to roll into a, a second single. Now, Paul, being a Beatle, whose Beatle ideas is what always kept me interested, how fresh they were, consistently overshoots any artist with uh, his willingness, his openness to uh, to achieve his goals. And he did it beautifully. Well, he, I, it was interesting because he not only he used social media with all the little clues, but then the James Corden thing worked out. That was that was you know, that worked out brilliantly. I mean, that was uh, uh, incredible. I was... think if, if he, to think this, uh, mm-hmm. CBS plunged so much money into that budget for that, that you wonder if Paul did a one hour special of him tipping around Liverpool, if, if he could get that off the ground, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It, it was absolutely over the moon. And so uh, it brought our hearts back to Paul to see him uh, reminiscing about the things we reminisce about. He's looking at his life. It's like, can you believe I was that guy? Right. Right. How about Ringo? Uh, how would you, uh, how, I mean, Ringo puts out an album that I, as I, uh, as I wrote uh, recently, he's working on another one. Yeah. Um, how, is there a way to, to boost Ringo from your point of view? Which, it, well, you know, he, he he's like, a, you know, in a world of Bob Dylan and stuff where they don't want to, you know, he knows he's smart enough to know that if he does an interview, people go, let's talk about the new album. But I have to ask you about the Beatles White album. Mm-hmm. But I have to ask you about the upcoming Let It Be stuff. And um, it takes off uh, the real interest the person really had in the beginning to talk to him about his new record. And his new records have been great, you know, with Todd, Todd and the band and the touring. So for Ringo... Uh, when you're when you're going to work on a tour and go out there uh, and play the sheds of the summer, uh, most of the promoters would hope that you have a new record to go behind it and that you feel a willingness to promote, which helps them attract uh, uh, when they call and they put the tickets on sale for the amount of money and need to get money for Ringo. Right. To say, you know, Ringo's fee went up because he's got a new album. He is meeting people. He is getting meeting the mayors, getting the, te- the key to the city and he is talking. So uh, he does that to be able to get himself out there. And he's always stood behind his, his, the truth of what he is, is I'm a musician. I like to play. These are my friends. And it's not, a, it's not hard to get on a plane and, and fly back at night and, and be around the right people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, again, okay. but again, once again, his, the weakness for Ringo isn't Ringo or his songs. It's the fact that if, 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 me, if it's noon and we're in L.A. at K-Earth, the oldie station, uh, you're going to play it don't come easy rather than to say, Hey, it's K earth and Ringo's got a new album. Let's hear the new song. Uh, It's just that uh, his hits were so big 
that they prefer to play that and keep you tuned in. Mm -hmm. And since we haven't mentioned him yet, we might as well mention George. Um, In terms of George's legacy, um, he's got, you know, he's got Danny. Danny just announced he's going to be supporting ELO uh, on tour on Jeff Lynn. Um, What's the, uh, what would you, what would you suggest there as far as uh, helping um, lift George's visibility? You know, I, I, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I, I, I really feel the error made in the last eight years with George was the, Scor- the Scorsese documentary on HBO. Really? really? And, and, and I don't take away from Scorsese, the documentary George, but that mm-hmm. it was on HBO because a lot of people don't have that. I don't. So I couldn't see that. I couldn't see uh, Al Pacino as the Phil Spector. So it, mm-hmm. limit, it limits you. Um, and you, did you know, and I didn't even know this, but, uh, I got a subscription to Spotify and you look up George Harrison and there's like this album uh, that I never saw. And it's a soundtrack to that HBO and it has things on it. I never heard before. And yet there was no presentation uh, for that. Is that the, is that the, uh, the demos, uh, the, yes. the, that was released, uh, in the stores actually. Um, yeah, it, it was really, it was really separately, but yeah, yeah but uh, I guess they put it out on Spotify. I didn't notice that they'd done that, but, um, yeah. And the other thing, what the other real high thing for George and I thought would, 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 more people get behind was the Grammy museum thing that Olivia did for, for George. It was the first time she went through Friar Park, grabbed stuff that never left that house, mm-hmm. never left their possession and flew it to LA. Um, and presented it, but it should have gone on tour everywhere. It should have been like Bowie's thing in New York, uh, London, uh, Japan, you know, the biggest Beatle markets. So, you know, that needs to be uh, a, a thought through for sure. Yeah. Are you excited about uh, the, the Let It Be re-edit? Oh, beyond control, because <laughs> as, as we all, we're all fans and we all know those Let It Be outtakes, when I got those tapes years ago through Richard DeLello, who was the house hippie, the longest cocktail party. Right. <clears throat> I, I went through those tapes and I went, this is fantastic. It's fun. It's laughing. These are great songs, great jams. And yet the, the, there's such a dark aura around the, the vibe of the movie, the disconnect of the Beatles. Um, but several years ago they did a, they did a recut of two rooftop songs and it was so joyous to see those, those rough cuts of them laughing, looking in each other's eyes, having mm-hmm. that chemistry and magic again. So uh, I know darn well that with 55 hours and some new eyes on it, we're going to, this will be the greatest ever. It can't get any better. Dave, I am honored to have talked with you again. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, and for doing all the stories. Um, just to to rehash, uh, Volume Three is coming on Kindle. The na- it's called um, Forty Five RPM. Forty Five RPM. Collections per minute. Okay, it's coming on Kindle, and then the fourth volume will be out in about six months. Yes, 10 years of Capitol Records. 10 years of Capitol Records, okay. Stop the presses, we have one more segment here, a confirmation from Ringo Starr's press office of a set list being used by Ringo Starr and the All-Star Band on their current tour. We don't know which stop this was. I suspect it's probably been at all of them because Ringo rarely changes. But uh, here we go. Uh, Matchbox, it don't come easy. What Goes On, those, of course, are Ringo. Evil Ways uh, with Greg Raleigh. Rosanna with Steve Lugather. Pick Up the Pieces with Hamish Stewart. Down Under with Colin Hay. Boys Don't Pass Me By and Yellow Submarine with Ringo. Cut the Cake with Hamish Stewart. Black Magic Woman and Gypsy Queen with Greg Raleigh. You're 16 uh, uh, and Anthem by Ringo. Overkill with Colin Hay, Africa with Steve Lukather, Work to Do with Hamish Stewart, Oye Komova with Greg Raleigh, I Want to Be Your Man with Ringo, Who Can It Be Now with Colin Hay, Hold the Line with Steve Lukather, and the last three are Ringo's Photograph, Act Naturally, 
and with a little help from my friends highlighted by a little bit of Give Peace a Chance. There you have it. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. You can catch us on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, and everywhere you can find podcasts because we're all over the place. Uh, Be sure to check out our That's What I Want Beetle page for links for things that uh, come up all the time that you might be interested in, including the link for Candy Leonard's uh, Beetleness. Candy Leonard is the uh, contributing editor to this podcast. Uh, and also my book is there, my ebook, uh, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, which has my interviews with Davy in it. Um, also, um, I have a Facebook page, Beatles News and Information, um, that you're welcome to join, where we post all sorts of Beatles stuff, not just stuff I do here, but um, uh, everything, uh, all sorts of Beatles news. And one thing I did post there recently was a previously unreleased picture of John Lennon and the story behind it. Uh, I was the first one to post it, and it's on the page, and you're more than invited to check it out. Anyway, thanks again for listening, and until next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying... Be seeing you!